Thank you so much. For the past 30 days or so, I've been preparing for a play at the Hickory Community Theater. It's an Irish wake, and I play the part of Father Damon Fitzgerald. Now, this guy has some serious character problems. And so the director says, you're the guy. <laughs> the real challenge, though, is getting a guy from Burke County to somehow come up with anything that sounds like an Irish brogue. That's the job. My interaction with knowledge, at least at its nuanced levels, began in high school. I was on the debate team, and we discussed things like nuclear proliferation and how to integrate, or should we integrate, disabled students into the regular classroom. I began to notice that, my goodness, there's a lot of big issues out there for which there doesn't seem to be this aha answer that everyone just immediately resonates with. That was an interesting discovery. I went on and several others on the team to do dramatic interpretation, extemporaneous speaking. What we were learning is that there's great power in communication. The pieces of information that are shared, the way they're packaged and presented, the parts that are left out, really can change people's beliefs, and that's powerful. So, I went on to do music, um, a choral conductor. I taught at the collegiate level for several years, then got into full-time church music. About five years ago, we decided we wanted to move back to Hickory. Um, I grew up in Drexel down the road. We wanted this to be the place that our kids would call home, and it's been great. I started teaching at Hickory High School, doing choral music there. And then after about two years, they asked if I would teach the International Baccalaureate course called Theory of Knowledge. And I was like, oh, this is great. I love it. So, what the course does, if you're unfamiliar with it, this is for the purpose of preparing students to go out into the world and really be change agents. There's an IB learner profile. I'm going to list some attributes. I want you to let your mind wander a little bit. Think about people that you know who possess these qualities. You might even think of circumstances, situations that are in the news. That which, when you hear these words, your mind kind of goes to that place. Thinker, balanced, knowledgeable, a communicator, a risk taker, reflective, an inquirer. You may not observe, but if you're keen, you might see that you, your mind starts to make a connection. In other words, confirmation bias starts to slip in. If you think of a particular issue that you feel a certain way about, a person who agrees with you on that topic is knowledgeable. They're balanced. They're caring. If someone is on the opposite side of the issue, you have already kind of pushed their viewpoint out of the way. They couldn't possibly be balanced in their perspective. This is something I've discovered is just a human condition that's instinctive. It's just so hard to push aside. It's like a camera that is just unable to focus. It's not autofocus. You have to dial in the image. But some people, and all of us at certain times, are unable to make those adjustments so that we can see the image clearly or from a different perspective. Now, IB in the Theory Knowledge of Class has arranged all the knowledge of the world into eight categories. So there's mathematics, there is um, natural sciences, human sciences, the arts, ethics, history, religious knowledge systems, and indigenous knowledge systems. We love talking about the last one in class. See, this goes way beyond your kind of eighth grade report, bring us in some food, show us an outfit. We want to know how these people think. How do they approach the world? What do they value? And why do they value that? And that helps inform the TOK student into being a more empathetic person in the world. So, once we get these areas of knowledge out there, then we start delving into the ways of knowing. How is it that we come by information and process it in our mind? And there's eight of those as well. There's language, reason, sense perception, emotion. There is faith, there it is, intuition, imagination, and memory. Oddly enough, I should have put that one first. 
So what happens is corporations, they understand this. They try to train their employees in ways to work together, to be harmonious. Um, I remember going to a conference where people had to wear certain colored hats when they spoke in a certain way. Sometimes we get into trouble, though, if we think that harmony is the main objective. Because if you're trying to grow, take your business to the next level, there's going to be some wrangling about, and it's going to be difficult. It can be explained this way. The crucible of competing values is not for the faint of heart. It's refining fire, sullies the emotions. And so we get into these discussions about how do we apply the areas of knowledge in such a way to bring about positive change. I love um, Bill Ekstrom's way of describing this in the growth rings. You start with a stagnation. Um, ring where there's not much room for free flow of thought and new ideas. Everything's very predictable, which moves you into that level of comfort. It's uh, right on point. There's no controversy. Everything is smooth. But then what happens, maybe as a young person, you go off to college. You meet a new friend. You move to a different part of the country, and new ideas are put in your forefront of your view, and you have to deal with them. You have to reconcile those with preconceived ideas that you've had. It challenges you and makes you want to struggle and move forward through that. So growth tends to happen in those moments of unsettledness. So how do we teach TOK students to get through that? We use a, a technique of developing knowledge questions. Knowledge questions engender uh, communication. They're open-ended. There's two ways that we teach the students to do it. You can start with a knowledge question and then try to find real life situations for which the observations gained from the knowledge question can be applied. The students like starting with a real life situation, an occurrence, an article, a piece of art, and then try to back up from there and develop a knowledge question. The significance of it is you need to be able to de develop ideas about the knowledge question without even referring to the specific situation, thereby getting a broader view and one that can be applicable to other things. So in other words, knowledge questions are deliberately uh, conceived to be open, general, even contentious. Um, they're designed to invite conversation, not a single definitive response. So after the knowledge questions have been gained, we start having conversations about really important things. In the class over the past two years, we've discussed things like the Confederate monument debate. We've discussed gun control, the vouchers in schools. So many issues that come up, the culture just provides one after another. And we can talk about these things in civil tones and really try to uncover what are some of the deeper layers that we need to find and analyze so that we can best uh, learn from another perspective. One of the things that is a favorite component of the class is guest speakers. It's been alluded to already today that we cannot possess all the knowledge and all the subjects that we need. So if we're gonna traffic in areas where we have some interest, we want to understand better, we need the people who know what they're talking about to come and speak to us. So we've had medical doctors come to the class, we've had poets, we've had um, life coaches, financial advisors, uh, yoga instructors. I mean, across the gamut of all the eight areas of knowledge, we try to bring in speakers to facilitate discussion and open up the students' minds to different ways of perceiving these ideas. It's been so helpful and instructive because it helps the students move past the same way we all grow up. We come to certain viewpoints, we adopt certain ideas about things, whether they're political, the, the desires to be happy, what is wealth and how do we attain it, all the things that are common to the journey of life. These students have the opportunity to delve in in a deeper way. So what's the real point of it all? For students and for each of us, we have to acknowledge that this idea of confirmation bias is just a part of who we are. If I were to look at your Facebook wall or you were to look at mine, we'll see comments that would might give us a clue that, yeah, there's a person there that could benefit from a more sturdy approach to gaining knowledge. But the reality is we're all guilty of it. We don't want to admit it, but we are. And so the people who can acknowledge that it's there, seek to obliterate it at any cost, 
Those are the people that are going to make great leaders in the future. Thank you.